Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. I am so excited about today's show. I've said this before, and I will say it again. I love artists. I love those people in the theater, both on stage and behind the scenes, who make the theater thrive and come alive. And on a sad note, our theaters have been shut down. Today marks 303 days but the ghost lights will burn brightly and it will burn through each and every one of us, putting our lives, our messages, uh, everything out in the forefront so that we can all celebrate each other. And that again is what my show is about. I love celebrating artists, but it's even easier when I think I can call those artists friend. Uh, Neva Small, who is our guest today. Uh, we have uh, broken bread together. We have been at parties together over the years. Uh, and it's no more than just a hello, how are you, and the small talk that you normally have at a party. But a couple of weeks ago, our mutual friend, Ron Spivak, hello, Ron, suggested that I sit down and celebrate Neva's life, legacy, and career. And it was a no-brainer. I said, yes, yes, yes. I immediately reached out to her. We picked a date and a time, and here we are. Before we bring Neva on, uh, my editor and producer, uh, Charles Pennington, has put together a very special tribute to Neva. I hope she likes what we've put together. And then we will be seeing Neva on the other side. Everybody, today I celebrate Neva Small. Matchmaker, matchmaker, you know that I'm still very young. Please take your time. Muscle tough inside. No. We don't feel that way. Papa? Papa? Papa, I've been looking everywhere for you. Bye, Papa. Mama. Come, Hava. Neva Small, how are you? Oh, that was so beautiful. Thank you, Charles. Richard, thank <laughs> well, you. Uh, I have to tell everyone, I mean, this, of course, is a pivotal moment in your life and career. But before this even came along, you were a veteran. I mean, you had done so much prior to this, which we are going to get to, and uh, we're going to celebrate it all. But before we get there, um, I began all of my shows uh, by asking everybody, Unfortunately, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Um, how are you dealing with everything, uh, really? How is everything going? Well, um, as you know from our, our personal relationship, my husband, my wonderful soulmate, 
the most fabulous man, physician, healer, friend, father, lover, everything to uh, all of us died in April after a two year battle with T cell lymphoma cancer. And I of course was with him every moment. Uh, he was the valiant fighter, but I was there as caregiver. He died in the middle of April at the height of the pandemic. It was a very complicated time in order to shepherd him to his final resting place. All funerals, shiva, anything normal, uh, traditional was suspended. So it has been uh, a challenging time via COVID. And I have gotten through it with, with this, this book. And this uh, CD was sent to me by my Memorial Sloan Kettering buddy, who I stumbled into, luckily, one of the social workers. Now, there is a little glare on the book. What's the name of the book? It's called Good Grief, Healing Through the Shadow of Loss. And there's a DVD, a CD in the back of it, which I fall asleep to. Mm -hmm. And it starts with, I've got the line memorized, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And that has been a great help. I'm in a bereavement group of others who've lost their soulmates through Cancer Care, the most wonderful organization. And of course, I have uh, two adult daughters, two grandsons, and one baby girl on the way, and wonderful support family. I also belong to a singer's studio Titchman training, Nomi Titchman, and we did a Zoom concert, a Zoom cabaret through this, which takes time to work on with the theme being isolation. And I worked on a song that has given me a lot of sustenance through this, No One Is Alone. And other songs have given me sustenance, like a new meaning, I'll be seeing you, many of the American standards, that have to do with deep and profound love and loss. And also I work with teenagers. And then finally, this is Latka. Hi, Richard. Oh, How I'm so you glad doing? you brought him on. Thank you. Of course, of course. And it was Hanukkah. So I want you to know that I love latkes. How do you eat your potatoes? Oh, I love latkes. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm going to go off and make some for you now. See oh, that? I would love it. I, You know, if you deliver, please send them. I do. You rem uh, did you know my dear friend, Dana Lorge? No. Well, she always called me her Leighton Jew friend. She says, you are more Jewish <laughs> than some of my Jewish friends because, I mean, and we used to do a show together, and I would learn these Yiddish expressions, and I would come in, and uh, so latkes, you know, I love, 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 love. Um, you know, well, I want to thank you. Yiddish, maybe Tevye's in your future. Maybe there's a Tevye. Well, the Yiddish speaking one. Um, the recent revival, uh, which was all in Yiddish, uh, he, you know, that Tevye, he was not Jewish. Stephen Skybell? Yeah, Stephen Skybell. I don't think he's Jewish, is he? Yeah, I think so. Oh, but, but, but many, but many of the company members are not. Are not. And they I and I was I was lucky enough through our uh, dear friend Jana Robbins to go to the opening night, and um, I said, "Oh my God, I love this show so much. I wish that I could be a part of it." The moment it began, uh, I'm sure you saw it, didn't you? The moment it began, I began to cry. And I love the story um, that was told when it opened in Japan. And they said, how did you, you know the story? Of course, but I want you to tell it. No, you, this is about you. you, tell you, tell you. Well, it, you know, when it opened in Japan, uh, you know, and perhaps you, you will know better than I am who what it was that said this, but said, how did you capture the story of our people? And, you know, how, give and it, how did Americans identify with it? <laughs> and, here's the punchline. Yes, no, you. Oh, Japanese. Oh, Japanese. Which is true. 
And um, when the three of us, the, the three daughters, did the world tour, the international tour to uh, for all the premieres, uh, we went to Japan and the Takuratsuka, which is Ron's favorite, you know, the, that's the, the company where it's gender switching. Uh, they did Fiddler there. And it was just... Uh, Everything that you would think of, the, the the old and the new on the streets of Japan, the grandmas in kimonos, and then the more green hair. And so it's true. It's very, very true. Well, I'll tell you my connection with Fiddler, and then we're going to move on and focus on you. Well, uh, but uh, when my husband and I got married, uh, Josh Ellis, who officiated our wedding, reached out to Sheldon Harnick. And we were one of the first 100 couples, uh, same-sex couples to get married in New York. And he said uh, the most famous uh, wedding song, Sunrise, Sunset. Um, but now, and it's all about traditions, um, would you write special lyrics for the song for their wedding? And I didn't know about this until after Sheldon and Jerry said yes, and they wrote special lyrics. Uh, you can see it on YouTube. Jana Robbins sang it at our wedding. And uh, so I will always have that connection. And when the documentary came out that you were recently in, they had reached out to me, but there was so much to cover that oh. I didn't make it to the final uh, cut of the film. But oh, we'll uh, have to look for that footage on the cutting room floor. Yeah, yes, it's very, well, very, very very um, and you also have a very unique distinction that you know not a lot of actors in New York have, and that is that you were actually born in New York City. That's true. Yes, yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you grew up on the Upper West Side uh, at Central Park, uh, uh, and uh, your mom was a harpist uh, through Juilliard. So you had music in your home uh, all the time. Um, I'm always interested in the five-year-old self because the five-year-old self is that unencumbered person that hasn't had the layers of life placed upon them. So can you take us all back to the five-year-old Neva Small? <laughs> well, the, uh, I started uh, performing pretty young, but not as young as five. So my uh, basic memory from five years old that I was known for is we lived on the second floor, it's true, on Central Park West. And I uh, there was a party going on, a dinner party, maybe some music. I got a hold of my father's wallet and from the second floor started throwing bills out the window. <laughs> So giving it away, like we're gonna do today. <laughs> like we're gonna do today, giving it away. So that was my, uh, that's my five-year-old self. Shortly after that, I became a, a stage child. And here, I'm a prop actress. And here is my mug from the summer stock tour of Showboat, where I played Kim, Magnolia's daughter, and Captain Andy, Oh, my lipstick. That would be Andy <laughs> Devine. Wow. And you know who played Julie? Keely Smith. Wow. In it. Oh. And Andrew Frierson sang Old Man River. And his wonderful daughter and I became friends and are still friends. Andre Andrea Frierson, once on this island. And... Uh, she did the most wonderful piece at Your Friend and wonderful interview, the York Theater. Mm -hmm. She did a wonderful piece about her parents who were both African-American opera singers when it wasn't so easy to be that. She did a fabulous one-person show while well, she had the band, mm -hmm. lots of songs and in tribute to them at, at the York. And can you tell us a little bit about your parents and uh, your mom and your dad and uh, the dynamics of their relationship and growing up with your mom? Was she always working or were there periods between gigs? Uh, as a musician, my guess is that she was working a lot. My mother was a graduate in the first graduating class of harpists from Juilliard, which was 1938. Um, Marcel Grandjeunet was the name of their instructor, and he composed a lot of 
uh, harp repertoire, kind of in that league with Nadja Boulanger and those names. Um, and my father was much older than my mother, like about 22 years older, and he was quite a bachelor, and he went on a cruise, which I guess, you know, bachelors mm -hmm. do. And on that cruise, he met a dad and a son, not just any dad and son. He met Samuel Bernstein and Lenny, Lenny Bernstein. Oh. <laughs> now, Lenny was right in the middle of my father's age, and his father, Sam Bernstein, mm -hmm. plus my father had an apartment in the Beaux-Arts, which still exists near the UN. Mm -hmm. And so when Lenny wanted to come to New York, they were comfortable sending him to stay with my father. My father would rent a piano for him. My father knew a few house managers and when they would go to Broadway. Then when he began dating my mother, the harpist, all she ever heard about was Lenny, Lenny, Lenny. And <laughs> of course, that great big break when Lenny subbed, he was the understudy and conducted the Philharmonic and he became best man at my parents' wedding. We have some great pictures and in a, in a PowerPoint that I do that has to do with being Chava and my history and Fiddler on the Roof and Shalom Aleichem and our wonderful Sh Sheldon Harnick. Anyway, uh, eventually I was cast, I wonder why, in The Mass, which opened the Kennedy Center. Leonard Bernstein, of course, was at the auditions, and Stephen Schwartz. So it kind of comes full circle. There you have it. You, but you, your stage debut, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you played uh, Beverly Sills' daughter uh, at New York City Opera. That's um, do you have, I mean, what are your memories of that? Oh, she was wonderful. And in that, I did three operas, New York City Center Opera. They At that time, the New York Opera was there at the City Center. And I did Susanna Street Scene. And those, I was just one of the kids, kind of like I was one of the kids mm -hmm. on the Mitch Miller TV show. But in the Ballad of Baby Doe, I had a singing role. And I, you know, I could sing it today. Why is there no school today? Mommy, what's happened? Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, she was wonderful. And throughout my career, I would see her. She lives in Sheldon's building, actually. Oh, wow. She lives in Sheldon's building, that wonderful building. Isaac Stern was there, too, my favorite. And my current favorite is there, too, but I better not say because maybe someone will go knocking on the door. <laughs> but anyway. Um, you can tell me later. She was great yeah. and uh, came backstage to something else I did and said, hold on to those pipes, kid. So I always remember. Well, how exactly did that happen? Um, did, I mean, because your mom was in the business, uh, did someone reach out and say, we need a child for this? Or was there any type of an audition that you had to do? What exactly transpired that got you into that show? I was already studying, uh, partly because it was a place to park me, because my parents were running a business together at that time. My mother really wasn't performing professionally as a musician. By then, they had uh, morphed into business people. And so it was a place to park me. It was Mr. Polanski's Saturday music classes. And then it was Charlie Lowe's tap dancing, although that never really took off, although you showed that beautiful segment with dancing. But Tommy Abbott, may you rest in peace, and Sammy Bay is very much alive, said, just run like you're going to catch a bus because I was never that much of a dancer. So that's how it kind of started, being a kid in New York. I did uh, I did Hansel and Gretel. I would get on the bus up there on Central Park West and go all the way down to Greenwich Village where I do Saturday theater for children. And it kind of just one thing kind of led to another. Very much like the category I'm in now. When you're a kid, there's less competition. Oh, when you're an old lady, I hope there's less competition. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, watching some of the other gals that you've interviewed, it especially Michelle Paul, they don't look at each other like competition, which was so nice, very mm -hmm. refreshing. She said Randy Graff got her the job at Wagner, and it put a whole perspective on it for me. I'm telling you, I've had to do a lot of introspection in getting ready for this interview. Well, you know, I you know, when I look at all of our careers, and I have had the good fortune of interviewing the best in the business, including yourself, um, but when I get the opportunity to interview these people, the one thing that I have learned that has created these incredible careers is generosity of spirit. 
the fact that people are willing to say, and there was a time where people would say, you know, I just got a call for this role. I'm not exactly right for it, but you should go and see the uh, audition. Um, who are some of the people along the way in your life that you feel opened those doors for you? Well, I have to say, number one, Bob Merrill because I did actually three shows of Bob Merrill's. And I was a teenager when I did Henry Sweet Henry. And then I'm told that he wrote the part of Leah in The Prince of Grand Street, which was set in the Yiddish theater. We've talked about that. Um, so with me in mind. And later I did, uh, at, at the Vineyard, I did uh, Hannah 1939. You know, by then I was an adult with my own children, but I, I, he, he wrote a part that I played with the wonderful Julie Wilson. So I would say Bob Merrill. Julie Wilson was a friend of my mother's. They had a makeup artist in common because my mother long before anybody else wore individual eyelashes. And so I would say they did and then I want to give a salute to the, the Klinghoffer family because the Klinghoffer family came to see me in many, many cabarets when I was starting. I think we did something on Second Avenue, one of the cabarets. And from that family, I did, as we mentioned, all the things we've lived through as Americans. It was the first time we heard the word terrorist mm -hmm. in Oct October 7th, 1985, when the ship, the Achille Laura, was hijacked and their father was killed aboard and all of the aftermath of that, including their mother speaking before mm -hmm. Congress and uh, many events. And then selling the movie rights and arranging for me to play one of the daughters. And in that crowd is one of my, another way I'm getting through the pandemic, yes. is one of our dear Maura Spiegel, who is also one of the adult, now adult children, we have our own in that group, who recently wrote the Sidney Lament, Lament A Life. And I'm up to the part where he marries Lena Horne's daughter. Look, yeah. That's incredible. Uh, send her my way. <laughs> I would love to sit down and chat with her. Um, okay. But your, your Broadway debut, uh, came in a show called Something More, uh, How Prophetic, uh, with that title. Um, what are your memories of getting into your first Broadway show? Uh, you, of course, were a child. Uh, and, you know, the dynamics of being there and having to have a tutor and, uh, a, you know, a chaperone, all of those things that were in place. Well, that's kind of interesting because that's where my mother's intelligence comes in because she was a stage mother. There are no stage children without a stage mother, but in the best sense of the word. And one day I came home, the show was directed by Julie Stein. The score was by one of the few Broadway shows the Bergmans wrote, Marilyn and Allen. The score, the music by Sammy Fain. But Julie Stein was the director. And one day I came home and I said, Mommy, Mr. Stein says, he asked me, should we go this way? Should we go I that way? I love this story. <laughs> and then my mother was like, he asked you? And shortly after that, Joe Layton took over. But it was a wonderful cast. Uh, Jojo Smith, Paula Kelly, the great Barbara Cook, I played her, one of her three children, sang High Seas in a Bikini from Center Stage, Arthur Hill, and if you read Barbara Cook's uh, memoir, autobiography later, you'll find more out about that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it was a great, great experience. And, you know, one, once in a while I see the Bergmans and I like to sing their music from ballroom and things like that. But, uh, you know, it only ran two weeks, which these days, that's uh, not such a short time. I, be, I began to be in shows that ran one night, like Frank Merriwell. But my mother was kind of always the guardian angel. She made sure I had the right costumes. She would watch the previews, but very understated. As soon as the show opened, she was out of that. You never saw her again. Now, of course, in this business, we all make choices. Sometimes they're the right choices. Sometimes at that time, they seem like the right choices, but they may not necessarily be the right choices. And uh, I you know, did a lot of research on you. And I know that you had the option of doing Godspell, 
or another show and you chose the other show. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, the choice that you made and looking back on that time, do you still feel that you made the right choice at that time? The, the musical version of The Member of the Wedding was going to run at the Circle in the Square directed by Ted Mann, who by the way was married to an opera singer also, Patricia Brooks, who when Beverly Sills wasn't playing that role in the ballad of Baby Doe at New York City Opera, Pat Patricia Brooks was. Um, and so that is the part I was cast in to play Frankie in the musical version of Member of the Wedding. Now who doesn't love Member of the wow. Wedding? Carson McCullers to this day. We always have to thank the people with the pencil, be they Carson McCullers, Shalom Alechem, mm -hmm. Lynn Manuel, whoever they are. Yes. Uh, but um, so, you know, it was kind of a no brainer because Frankie is the lead and there were some wonderful songs that I still sing and that are on my CD. Uh, my, I have two CDs and a children's CD out. And uh, it was called Sweet Peach Ice Cream. And by the way, the writer of that was an actor who had, you know, increased his, his repertoire and tapped into writing. He was a Southerner like you. And so that's the way it went. That's the way it went. But you still, you made the right decision at that point in your life. Yeah, you know, I've often thought about, well, I wonder if I would have gone into Godspell. Would, <laughs> I have, would I be in Wicked? Or would I have gone on to be Sesame Street where they got picked up from, but I wouldn't have. Well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, you've had this amazing career. How much of it do you feel has been... Uh, proactive on your part in terms of what you've pursued and how much of it has been these are opportunities that have come your way because of the connections that you've made along the way well you just hit a nerve <laughs> um you know i one of the reasons why it was a challenge to get ready for today's interview uh, beside the fact that, you know, America came crashing down last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we are living through something again together, mm -hmm. uh, including the pandemic, is um, that uh, I'm not a person with a great amount of drive. I love the arts. I really love those moments when you get inside in the inner life of a song and those few moments when you really release into a character or as my parents put it, my calling card forever, Fiddler on the Roof, to have people come to you with their experience. I saw it with my grandmother, or I played it in high school. All of that is such a gift. Even the couple of law and orders I've been on. But I was never really, I never had the drive of some of the people that I've worked with. Like for example, Tova Felcher, I played opposite her um, in Yento. And she, her memoirs are coming out, everyone. And we, I'm gonna be interviewing her. Oh, really? So Yes, oh, uh, we've been uh, sending emails back and forth today, as a matter of fact, and I love her dearly. So a lot of, someone like Tova has a lot more drive than I did, but I'm working on it. I'm working on my ambition. So um, it's, a, you know, it's two words, it's show business. And I guess I was more in love with the show than the business. And then I took time off to be a mother, a wife and a mother. That brings me to my next question. And we are going to get to Fiddler, everyone. Uh, I know a few people are asking about that. Uh, but um, you have uh, you had a wonderful marriage, uh, two beautiful daughters. How are you able to balance the two? And what advice do you give to someone who wants to be both a mother, a wife, and have a career in this business? Well... Once again, that's kind of where strategy comes in. And I figured, oh, I'm a mother, I'm in the middle of Manhattan, you know, they'll find me. But it doesn't exactly work like that. Although I did many things over the years, like we talked about Oliver. I did do summer stock wherever we would go away for the summers. I would find like the theater companies, like Forestburg Theater I did three plays at, and, and, and Madison Lyric in Connecticut. And um, so it, it's not, it's more complicated than it looks. And, and my favorite role was being a mother. So there you have it. And you succeeded. That, I mean, that you deserve a star on your dressing room door for. You know that, yes. Thank you. Thank so you. let's talk about Fiddler. 
Um, let's go back to the Broadway show, for example. Um, now, was it that you didn't get an audition for them or that you did get an audition and they told you? No, actually they would not see me because they said I wasn't Jewish enough. <laughs> and so they gave the role to Pia Zadora of The Littlest Sister. Mm -hmm. And then later, Henry Sweet Henry comes along and guess who was my understudy? <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, that's how that went. And, and when did you first hear, I mean, the show ran a, f a couple of years before the film came along. So when did you first hear about the fact that there was going to be a movie version of Fiddler on the Roof? And how did that come about? And I know this was another moment in your life where you had the option, and I'm sure that it was not a no-brainer, to go off and do this film or to go off to school, Juilliard. And right. this yeah. was one of the crossroads in your life. Uh-huh. That's right, and there was a, an important uh, advisor, the dean of, of Juilliard, John Houseman, who said, go do the movie, we'll still be here. Um, but what happened was uh, a lot of it has to do with a remark that Christina Pickles made to me that I always remember. Christina Pickle played Marilyn, the Klinghoffer mom in the, in the TV version, the, uh, uh, hijacking of the Achilles Laurel. And I said, well, you know, I kind of got cast because I know the King of Maryland thing up. And she said, how do you think things are done in Hollywood? <laughs> how do you think things are done in Hollywood? When I was off, off Broadway as a teenager, I played opposite Vivica Linford's son, who was in something more actually, Chris Tabori, father director George Tabori. And uh, it was called How Much, How Much? And the director of that play became the New York casting director of The Fiddler on the Roof. And at that time, I was with a very big agency, and there was a very young agent there at the time named Rick Nasita, who's gone on to be quite a producer, and he has big Wesleyan connections. So do we, because my daughter and son, younger daughter and son-in-law both went to Wesleyan, and uh, as did Lynn manuel so we're all very proud of Wesleyan and Lynn manuel Then there's a Rick Nasita movie gallery there. Rick Nasita made sure to meet every client who was there, including the teenagers such as myself. So that's kind of how it went in. And then I, I had five auditions. I sang a few times in New York for Norma Jewison and the wonderful John Wood. Now, were all of the auditions in New York or did you go out west to audition? They flew me out for two screen tests because mm -hmm. because of my strong singing and my not as strong dancing, run like you're gonna catch a bus. Mm -hmm. Don't dance, just run like you're gonna catch a bus. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was flown out for both Huddle and Hava uh, at that time. So I had two screen tests for both those roles. And there I am running like I'm gonna catch a bus. And you know, there's another person I, I missed touting my hat to, and that would be Michael Bennett. Mm -hmm. Because Michael Bennett, his second show was Henry Sweet Henry. His choreographer was a joyful noise, then Henry Sweet Henry. And uh, from there, Michael directed his first play which was Twigs, and here comes my mom again. And, and she loved Michael, and she recognized his talent. She was very good at recognize the ta recognizing talent. And he came to her and said, could you put money in the show? And she did, she put money in Twigs, Seda Thompson Twigs. Of oh. course, I always, why didn't he ask her to put money in Chorus Line? <laughs> <laughs> By that time. But anyway, yeah, so I, I should tout Michael Bennett, and through through Henry Sweet Henry, there are still a lot of relationships in my life. Those would be Bayark Lee, mm -hmm. that in in our community, in our wonderful theater community. One of the yeah. ways we've gotten through the pandemic is through the activities of the Actors Fund, of Ron's and Troy's theater, and also the Actors Temple has helped me a lot with my with my faith and with recognizing the year post Fred. Now, your training is um, on stage. Uh, was it an easy or difficult transition for you to do film work? It wasn't with Fiddler. There was rehearsal involved with Fiddler and um, the wonderful ensemble of actors, 
Leonard, may he rest in peace, who we lost to the AIDS epidemic. We've all lived through and lost from. And uh, Paul Michael Glazer and Norman Jewison, wonderful, wonderful director, great cinematographer, Norma Crane, rest in peace, and Topol, all of them. So, and I was young enough and open enough to be able to handle that role. Now it's a little more challenging. I've just done a workshop, actors, actors uh, acting on television with a wonderful casting director. And uh, it's a challenge. I have to, to decrease my, my style. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, after you had done the two screen test and then you also sang for them in New York, um, when and where were you when you found out that you were going to be doing the film? And take us back to that moment for you. Well, I was back home and uh, I, I got the role and that night, I couldn't sleep at all. I did not sleep. And my father found me awake at night, pacing in the living room. What's wrong? And I said, why did they give me the film? Why me? You know, and he said, well, if you would like to call them and tell them you don't want to do it, it's okay. You can call them. <laughs> that straightened me out pretty fast. I mean, it's funny in life how we, you know, I, I, tomorrow I'm doing um, a show on Paul Lynn, and he <laughs> suffered from tremendous stage fright. And it's amazing in our business where we work so hard to get something. We get it, and then we get so nervous about it. Were you nervous about living up to the role? Were you just nervous because you didn't feel that you were ready to do films? What was it that you were internalizing at that moment? Well, I never think it's, this is this is a, this is a probably therapy time. I, uh. I you know, part of me never thinks I'm special enough. Both my husband and I suffered from what you call what is called the imposter syndrome. Right up until this day, and my husband was a very popular dermatologist with a Fifth Avenue practice, and yet still we'd sit around going, oh, you know, we suffer from the imposter, the imposters, and we're quiet people. Basically, I'm quiet. Basically, I'm a loner. It is also one of the things that I've been able to get through the pandemic because of being a loner. And I forgot to mention the dog, the dog community. Mm -hmm. My dog has helped a lot too. Well, we love our dogs. Um, mine is in a crate so that he wouldn't be barking and uh, upstaging you at this moment. You have a new dog, right? Uh, I have a Maltese uh, named Benny. Uh, Hurst. Yes. Now you sent um, a few photographs and I'm gonna share these photographs. Uh, <laughs> dog lover. Uh, I'm gonna share a few photographs here. And if you can just tell us your thoughts or you know, what's going through your mind as you see these photographs. And here we are. Good, yep. There was that Central Park West, New York City girl. Where <laughs> that a milk a cow? <laughs> convincingly. And that gorgeous guy. Uh, actor Raymond Lovelock, although he was from Italy, had a British father. We lost him recently. Also a, a musician. And uh, do you have any other shots with with I, Do we uh, know? Yes. Ah, uh, Norman Jewison, wonderful Norman Jewison. So I should stop and tell a couple of stories. Raymond Lovelock, as gorgeous as he was, as I mentioned, was uh, raised in Italy, and although he spoke English fluently, it, oh, the scene with the book when when Fieca says, "Take the book," he said, "Take a book." with a thick Italian accent, take out a book. So we had to dub all of the scenes later. Now, the young men behind that wonderful director, actor, and he did lots of musical direction too, of the Dar's Day special and other musical specials, Norman Jewison. Behind him are the, you know, quote, villagers. Uh, and they were told to harass me and they did, they harassed me in that scene walking the cow, except they did it in Serbro, Croatian. We were filming in what is the former Yugoslavia. And later when the translators were watching the dailies, they realized they had been given the direction to harass me and they were using foul, disgusting language. As oh, well. to do. 
So that too had to be done. And we have this photo here, which I love this photograph. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there I am. I'm not running like I'm <laughs> but you're catching a bus. But that beautiful melody, and Jerry Bach credited a lot of those melodies um, from the time his grandmother, who was ill, came to live with them when he was a boy. And so he learned a lot of the folk melodies and maybe Little Bird, Little Chavala is one of them. Oh, that! Oh, I cry every time I hear that. Uh, and then this, I love this as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, here's a, here's a moment of, of inspiration through the music. And here's a moment we were talking about just losing yourself in the material in the character, with the inner life, all the things we work for and hope for. Right there. And here. And here we are on the world tour, and that would be Rosalind Harris. Oh, I love Roz. Do good, good. Still very much a neighborhood girl. And Michelle Marsh, who has become, uh, in addition to continuing to perform, uh, an instructor, an acting instructor, but she's on the other coast. And there I am in my fabulous coat, my mother bought, she did come to the set uh, in Yugoslavia. She came, I was turning 18, happy birthday. I said, mom, my birthday was yesterday. <laughs> now I wanna talk uh, for a moment. Hey, you, had you traveled a lot uh, when you went off to do this film? No, not at all. I hadn't traveled at all. Now, because of your age, you had to have a chaperone and your older sister went with you. That's right. Um, yes. and. Uh, so what was that experience like for you and your sister uh, to be in a whole new world? Well, I, I at the time was very curious. So I learned quite a bit of Serbo-Croatian. We were housed at the Hotel Esplanade. My next door neighbor was Molly Pecan, who was playing Yanta, and her husband, Janko. And, you know, you have a lot of time. Uh, when you're in uh, making a uh, movie like that. The movie took 10 months. I worked for nine months, some of which was England. Set, the time was spent in England. So I think it was great for both of us. And my sister stayed on in England and found an English husband. So there you go. So just out of curiosity, um, what was the first thing that you shot for the film? And what was the last scene that you shot? Well, uh, Rich Man was always saved for the rainy days, so that you know. And the dance sequences were all done at Pinewood, where uh, Harry Potter is. Mm -hmm. so one of the first things we shot was uh, Matchmaker. And uh, the littlest girl was also English, Candy Bonstein. And I love kids. To this day, I love kids. I work with teenagers. We can talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to come and visit me in New York. Well, she lasted about 48 hours. She was a very little girl. And we had to put her right back on the plane because she was homesick. So I hope I answered your questions. No. Uh, so that was, And then um, after the film was completed, uh, did you have to go back for any... Uh, additional scenes or anything, or was it uh, when it finished, it was finished for you as far as filming? Just the dubbing, just the dubbing because Raymond Lovelock, as gorgeous as he is, said, take her a book. <laughs> so and um, how long after you completed the film uh, did uh, the uh, promotion part of it come about? I would say about a year later, about a year later. We, we did the world tour. We went. I, I can say I can say Fiddler on the Roof in a lot of languages, including Japanese. Yane no bueno, violin hiki, uh, el violinisto en el tejado. I could say it in a few different languages. But uh, yeah, so we went to Spain. We went to Israel, which was quite exciting, and my mother did join me for Israel and uh, Japan. Oh, the Rothschilds, France. This is a good story. You'll like it. Mm -hmm. So it was the Paris Opera House. My mother found a gorgeous gown. My mother was very into clothing and wardrobe and costuming. And so I wore this beautiful gown to the Paris Opera House hosted by the Rothschilds. And it was my job to pick the raffle in intermission. And I picked, it was for a diamond bracelet. I picked it fair and square and it was Mrs. Rothschild. 
she was the winner that I picked wow. out of the bucket. And you can imagine how excited she was that she won yet another diamond bracelet. And how interesting that in the Yiddish version, it's if I were a Rothschild. <laughs> yeah, sure, I would have made that connection. Yes. <laughs> he sure can write. <laughs> now, um, when was the last time that you saw the film? Well, I've seen a lot of the documentary, Fiddler, A Miracle of Miracles. And I've also seen a lot of, oh, I told you I'm a prop actress. Sholem mm -hmm. Alechem, Laughing in yeah. the Darkness, a film by Joseph Dorman. This is wonderful for those Fiddler fans, if you haven't seen it. It is a documentary on the life and times and ups and downs of Sholem Alechem. It's amazing. And it's, av uh, it's available on Amazon.com. Now, I want to go back for a moment. Um, you know, another show that so many people, uh, as soon as your name is mentioned, it's Henry Sweet Henry. Um, so talk about that experience and that time frame in your life. Well, that was a great, uh, a great experience. I was very lucky. I'd done one musical, something more. I had done one two year run. And I think that was my only hit on stage, really. I didn't have a lot of hits on stage. Um, the Impossible Years starred Alan King and later Sam Levine, our original Nathan Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I played the younger daughter a uh, very nerdy younger daughter conducting Eine Kleine Nacht Mozart. And then, of course, by the end of the play, she's behaving more like the older daughter, and that poor dad has a headache. It was written by Groucho Marx's son, Arthur Marx, and I kept a pretty long-running pen pal with him. And I made many friends that I still have, because in those days, in those days, guys, shows tried out in Philadelphia, New Haven, and Boston. So I go to those places once again with my mother. And uh, often the parents uh, who had been in the audience would, would see us out at the Harvey House in Philadelphia where you get your ice cream sundaes and say, oh, I have a daughter your age. Would you like to meet her? And those daughters I am still friendly with to this day across the country. Um, did I answer your question? Did I go on? You did. <laughs> you did. Now, before we move on, I want to really talk about the work that you're doing now with these kids. But before we go there, you've been in the business a, a lifetime. Um, you've seen a lot of changes. What are the things that you've loved the most about changes that you've seen in the business? And what are the things that you've had the hardest time that you resist the most uh, as far as change? Well, I think what we're going through now, um, and that would be uh, all of us in our personal lives and as performers having to adapt to Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I saved this article, I'm telling you, on props all the way. This is by Melissa Rico, and it was already a few months ago before the pandemic on actors self-taping. So I've enjoyed that aspect of it, although my Amazon ring light is bouncing off the wall. And you know, I've, done, I've had some fun with that, uh, with that aspect of the change. I've, I've, I have really enjoyed it. And as far as change on a national level, it's really hard to get away from where we are. I like what Alex Rybeck said, January 20th, that's the beginning for all yes. of us. Yes, and not that would turn out that way. We're still all very tense. But yeah. look at the things we've lived through. I've made a, a list, some of which have been interpreted by the change and, and the interpretive artists. You have 9-11 come from away. You have what hooked me on American history, 1776, and now what hooks our teenagers on American history, Hamilton. You have the terrible period of lynching, Scottsboro Boys. You have uh, Alfred Urey parade, the, the murder of Leo Frank, the lynching of Leo Frank, and driving Miss Daisy, and uh, lots of other, other ways, um, the lives of MLFK, the films about their lives. But look at the things we've lived through. I had to make these lists. So, and King Lear was written in the midst of a pandemic. Everyone, you should know that. Did you know that? I, I, I for, I've forgotten. I, I did hear it, but I'm glad you're reminding us. I'm glad you're reminding us. Now, Neva, you've had the good fortune of working with so many people in this industry. Is there any one in particular that gave you a life lesson that you've carried through, not only in your professional career, but in your personal life as well? Zoe Caldwell. Now, I, 
I didn't actually work with Zoe Caldwell. Her husband, Robert Whitehead, mm -hmm. the true gentleman of the theater, produced The Prince of Grand Street, which we didn't get to visit very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, and Zoe would come and, and she would help me a little bit with that role. And then later, when I would have auditions, she would come over. I mean, they mostly lived in Connecticut and she was raising two boys and doing all those fabulous performances like master class, but she would still help me. She would still help me. So I would say Zoe Caldwell. And of people maybe you don't know that aren't as famous as Zoe, my actor friends, which would be Marilyn Chris, who lost her dear husband, Lee Wallach, lifetime actor recently. And, uh, Marjorie Johnson, and another one that I worked with way back when in Life is Not a Doris Day movie, Olga Meredith. Some of these people I've renewed my relationships with now in this time after Fred. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also in recent years and now currently, you work with kids and you are uh, building up the next generation. How did that start for you? Actually, through Actors' Equity, and I, you know, my hat is off to all these organizations that have helped me through the pandemic over the years. Um, as a mom, um, they kind of had a program where putting artists in the schools. So I've continued to be a teacher artist, and I take the children to theater, and very often I'll strategically choose the vehicles that they should see if they have a big world history regions final coming up. Then we go to Miss Saigon or something related to that. It's a collaboration with the Broadway League and the Department of Education. And in the case of Hamilton, I've taken kids to Hamilton. They, when they're studying US history, the Gilder Lerman affiliated with the Museum of Natural History History Organization and the producers and Lin-Manuel, Thomas Kale have subsidized one Wednesday matinee a month but the kids that are studying US history must produce something based on the curriculum that they provide for them, the Founding Fathers curriculum, and they must either do a monologue, a scene, a song, and then someone like me with their US history teacher will upload it, film it, upload it, submit it. And in the case of the schools I've worked with, the kids have gotten chosen, They that you have 1,500 kids in the theater on that Wednesday, and they perform their material, their original material for each other. There's usually a member of the cast emceeing, then they go have lunch, come back and see Hamilton. And I, I wanna, you, know, you are very, very fortunate that you grew up in a, a artistic household, with, especially with your mom and the work that you did as a young ch child. Um, a lot of kids don't have that exposure uh, and one thing that I am very passionate about is arts and education. Would you say to everyone watching and listening right now uh, why arts and education is so important to you? Well, I think, and we're not just talking about musical arts, theater arts, we're also talking about the visual arts. Um, there's all kinds of intelligences and, and the artistic expression is one of them. And sometimes a kid is never told, gee, you're really good at that uh, for their academics, but they are told that for a piece of art they might create or a song or a dance they might create. And there's a wonderful recognition in that way. And I wanted to recognize some of the studios that are also working with kids and also recognizing bringing the past and artistic contributions into the future. And that would be the Clark Center project, which is looking at the Clark Center dance studio and recognizing choreographers and dancers coming up. Titchman Training, which is the singing studio I work with. Steve Silberstein working with AMDA. And there are still lots of, lots of teacher artists out there giving opportunities to our kids. And I may, I have made a lot of theater goers and I have given our New York City kids the experience of going to the theater, which they should have and they do have. And your tax dollars are paying for up there. Oh, we didn't get to talk about your neck of the woods. I had to mention the restaurant, August, and the liquor store, Divine. And those are from my wonderful in-laws who are your neighbors. Are you serious? 
They're your in-laws? Susan and Stair. Oh, they're not the owners, but those are two of their favorites. And oh, I know. Right, right around, just right around the corner. I can walk to Divine right now. From they my love Spark Hill. <laughs> How do you know Spark Hill? Though through them. And part of another thing that's gotten me through the pandemic is popping on the Metro North and going up to the Irvington Boat Club because I'm an Eileen Fisher customer and it's in Irvington and uh, sitting by the river. And I've gotten to know your river towns during this time. Oh, no, on so what's next for you? Well, um, I continue to work with Tichman Training and I'm always working on material. And uh, mostly right now I'm working on the Jewish mothers. So I'm working on the Honeymoon in Vegas song, you know, just promise me, never get married. <laughs> I'm working on, I'm about to work on again through the studio, uh, Lost in Yonkers. And oh, well, let's bring Latka back. I'm doing more and more work with a tit, with with Richard Termini, who's the artistic director of the week at the O'Neill of Puppets. I still love puppets. I know you do, Neva. Oh, that's great. Oh. I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our show. Whew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, before we end, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the show. If you did, and if you don't mind, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. That helps to boost me and other markets. I want to let everyone know tomorrow is the anniversary of the passing of Paul Lynn. And uh, as you can see here, Kathy Fitzgibbon Rudolph, actually was very good friends with him. And she's written an amazing book. Uh, it's uh, right here. Uh, and uh, so we're going to talk about not only her relationship uh, with a man who unfortunately had these demons uh, that overtook his life and career, uh, but his artistry, what made him so special. And that's what I'm all about. It's all about bye bye birdie. Birdie. bye bye birdie bye bye birdie bye bye birdie um and I'm very very excited about tomorrow's uh, interview um I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return um I want you to go to your Facebook friends list uh, you too Neva go to the Facebook friends list pull up the ninth friend on the list and I want you to call that person and tell them what they mean to you not an email, not a text, not a private message, but a phone call. Reach out, let them know Hello. what they mean. <laughs> Hello, are you there? What you mean to me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you're trying to call me, my phone is turned off right now. <laughs> <laughs> The Actors Fund Benefit Game Night. Uh, yes, and I and I've uh, I've been sitting here and I've looked at you know and um, we have a winner and I'm going to tell you who it is. It's Leslie Orofino, um, who I have interviewed, and she's here watching. Uh, so she's won two tickets, which Neva will take care of. And Neva, I will send you the information on how to get in touch uh, with Leslie. So Leslie, thanks for being here. Um, before we end the show, I'm going to give you the final word. Um, but before I do that, I want to say thank you. Oh, thank you for your honesty. Thanks for... Uh, the gifts that you've given to the world and that you will continue to give to the world. Uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing with all the kids for the next generation. Um, so I'm going to give you the final word. Anything that you want to expound upon, upon anything that we talked about today that you just want to build upon. If there's anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, now's your chance to bring that up or just any message that you want to put out to the world right now. Uh, because as my dear friend, David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. Neva, I love you. Love you too. All of you, uh, another person, um, we'll talk, we'll do another show on the way you're doing on uh, uh, tomorrow on Robert Preston, also a great, great artist. Uh, I just want to say thank you all those of you, family, friends who have helped me through this time, my bereavement group, Cancer Care, and whatever you can do, Actors Temple, and America. Look what we've lived through. I know it looks a little crazy, but look at the things we've lived through. Hijacking of the Achille Laura, 
the AIDS epidemic, uh, the, the, bo the bombing of the African Methodist Church, the bombing of the Tree of Life Synagogue, Sandy Hook. Look what we've lived through, guys. Look what we have lived through. So hold on, hold on. I love you. Thank you. And Happy New Year, Diva.